Hi, this is Lit with Chris, and in this video, I'll be breaking down the theories known as feminism, queer theory, and Marxist theory, and how they can be applied to literature. Using literary theory is a great way to write essays that are original, analyse texts that aren't necessarily seen as academic or canonical, or simply a way to explore new ways of thinking that can broaden your mind. In this video, I'll be trying to explain feminist theory, queer theory and Marxist theory and how they can be applied to literature or cultural matters. Although the ideas in this video come from my research and understanding of the work of Peter Barry, Sandra Gilbert, Susan Gubar, Judith Butler and Terry Eagleton, there may be arguments or ideas or theories that I put forth in this video that you disagree with. If this is the case then please be my guest and write your ideas in the comments section below as it would be a refreshing and interesting opportunity to see and understand things from a different perspective. To begin with, let's quickly define what we mean by literary theory and how it is applied to literature that we study in class. When reading or analysing literature, everyone is potentially limited by the confines of their unique identity and set of experiences. For example, I, as a white, British, cisgender male person, born in the 1980s, have grown up with a set of invisible cultural values all around me that consistently influence the way I form opinions or judge the world. What literary theory can do is silence or obscure this way of seeing the world and replace it with a drastically different outlook on the way things work. As a case in point, let's take feminist theory as an example. Feminist theorists concern themselves with analysing gender inequality and using literature as an example of how this is present in human societies. They look at the way books reflect the discrimination and objectification of women in favour of male superiority and male sexual desire. Ideas such as patriarchy, a society designed around the preference for male interest and the male gaze, a way of looking and being seen in the world that empowers men and sexualizes women are popular topics for discussion. Such a theory allows students to reread popular texts from any time period and understand the way in which women were viewed, treated and mistreated by the prevailing culture. Another theory that was born out of the feminist movement was that of queer theory. Queer theorists do not necessarily see gender as the divisive variable in their studies, but that of sexuality and gender performance. Queer theory calls upon the student to see gender as a performative role. In other words, the way in which men and women dress, behave and communicate their sexual preferences are performances based on what they have learned from the world around them. Queer theory also claims that these expectations of both genders have no root in biological or cultural science, along with the idea that sexuality should not be seen in the current binary of straight and gay, which was only popularised in the 19th century. Therefore, queer theory allows the reader to question how sincerely characters in a text align with their chosen gender identity and the extent to which they are faithful to their wholly heterosexual outlook. Finally, we can trade gender and sexuality for economic and political status. Marxist theory calls upon readers to reconsider works of fiction from the perspective of the class-based system they were written in, the writer belongs to, or that the text depicts. Karl Marx was a political sociologist who claimed that most people are trapped by the economic situation that they find themselves in. Marx was specifically commenting on the way in which capitalist societies operate. There is a tendency for people to accept the rules of capitalism due to the fact that they have been born into it and know no other version of reality. This is why people are in constant pursuit of greater material existence despite the fact that they can see the system is not designed in their favour. We accept that there are people who are fabulously and often undeservingly more wealthy than us, provided that we can convince ourselves that there are people worse off and that we are on some sort of upward trajectory. Marxist theory, therefore, can be used to reveal the truth of economic or class-based struggle 
through literature. To better understand each of the respective theories, let's now apply them to a everyday object that may hold different symbolic meaning depending on your outlook or the type of theory that you're seeking to work with. Speaking from the point of view of a white British cisgender male born in the 1980s, the high-heeled shoe is a staple of female fashion that is commonly associated with the financial sector or a popular choice for footwear during formal occasions or parties. However, if we were to replace my outlook and apply the lens of feminist criticism, the high-heeled shoe might be seen as a symbol for the differing aesthetic standards between modern men and women. The motivation or pressure women feel to wear such shoes may be due to the way in which they seem to elongate the leg and hence enhance the desirability of the wearer. Given that there is no male equivalent, the shoe may be a perfect representation of the way female fashion is designed around the male gaze and its tendency to ensure that women appear in a way that best suits the desires of men. When added to the fact that they are often uncomfortable and responsible for developing health problems in later life, it is baffling that brands such as Christian Louboutin and Jimmy Choo remain aspirational purchases for many women, perhaps reflecting the internalised inferiority that women have been led to accept after centuries of patriarchal values. Switching our lens to that of queer theory, we might start to see high-heeled shoes as a defiance of what is accepted in the performances of men and women. The subculture of drag queens, more recently popularised through RuPaul's Drag Race, sees gay, straight, trans and questioning men don high-heeled shoes as an integral part of their performance on stage. Such a reclamation makes a mockery of the expectation for men and women to be assigned certain items of clothing and instead utilises the high-heeled shoe as a way to enhance an already hyper-glamorous appearance that reflects the spirit of the performer as opposed to their sex assigned at birth. Finally, Marxists may see buying and wearing a high-heeled shoe as a typical expression of materialist aspiration. The wearer may no doubt hope that the purchase will help contribute to an improved reputation in society or standing at work and therefore a better financial existence in the future. Marxist critics would be at pains to point out that such a purchase or desire for material goods is part of the problem that places the individual in this supposedly unsatisfactory present status in the first place. Although material purchases may directly or indirectly enhance one's professional standing, the system is designed in such a way as to trick consumers that their progress might be limitless provided they work and spend hard enough to reach the upper echelons of society. Sadly, the vast majority will not achieve this due to the continual conveyor belt they find themselves on that requires constant purchases, loans and therefore interest and a salary that will never dramatically increase enough to comfortably afford it all. Yet the purchase of a pair of expensive high-heeled shoes may convince us that we are making real economic progress in the world and that wealth is just around the corner. The high-heeled shoe does indeed offer an interesting insight in terms of how our interpretation can change depending on the type of literary theory that we are seeking to apply. But let's try them now with an actual work of fiction so that we can better understand what literary theorists actually do in practice. One text we can use to experiment with these literary theories is the James Bond franchise. Running since the 1960s, these films are based on the books by Ian Fleming and have become one of the most successful film series of all time. Applying our feminist lens, the films might be seen as a clear indication of the way patriarchal societies favour male progress over female. The protagonists' dealings with female characters are largely limited to them acting as beautiful helpers or accompaniments during Bond's missions. Alternatively, they are equally beautiful but deadly villains who lure Bond in with their desirability and place him in grave danger. Either way, 
This deprives women of occupying the lead and therefore heroic role and consigning them to an identity that is defined by their appearance, sexuality and or relationship with Bond success. The fact that the lead male role has only changed hands seven times in the past 50 years is also worthy of note when compared with the seemingly unlimited number of women who have slept with Bond, died in the crossfire or double-crossed him down the years. All of which has helped to hold the character up as a symbol of British masculinity at the expense of the conveyor belt of women whose names are barely remembered by the audiences that pay to see them. Moving to the queer theory lens, we're presented with a seemingly solid heterosexual dynamic in the Bond franchise, with the protagonist held up as one of the most recognisable male sex symbols in Western cinema. Yet despite the continual liaisons with mystery women from around the world, queer theory may shed light on the hyper-masculine performance of Bond that is obscuring a more complicated sexual identity. In keeping with the work of Judith Butler, Bond's outlook may be that the greater the number of women he beds, the more masculine he must be as part of her theory of performativity and the way it masks one's fear of his own inherent femininity or queerness. Indeed, Bond never tends to establish a meaningful or lasting relationship with any of these women, who all fail to satisfy him to the extent that the protagonist considers a monogamous relationship. Although there are one or two exceptions to this, these characters are often killed off within minutes of settling down with James. Another implicit indication of the franchise queerness would be the relationship between Bond and his respective nemeses. Almost always male, the antagonist is of great interest to Bond throughout the narrative, and when finally face to face with one another at the film's climax, it is notable how these confrontations often involve Bond bound, undressed and or at risk of genital mutilation. This almost overt threat to Bond's masculinity is eventually overcome because he finds himself back in bed with the lead female of the film, but not without having come close to surrendering or losing his hyper-masculine life to the other side. Lastly, we come to Marxist theory. The easiest place to start would be to point out that early Bond films positioned Soviet Russia as the enemy and hence established the pro-capitalist West as the ideal and righteous force of political outlook in the world. Hence, the franchise is built upon a narrative that belittles the politics of those within the old Eastern Bloc. This is enhanced by the fact that Bond is always portrayed as a spiritually liberal and charming man who can come and go as he pleases, whereas those from the old USSR are unhinged psychopaths or dourly dressed hitmen who have no joy in their hearts. Beyond this, some films in the franchise seek to underline the Britishness of the lead character and his patriotic virtues, references to the Queen, Downing Street or simply the iconography of the Union Jack flying around London serves to enhance the series' affiliation with British values that will play well with home crowds as well as Anglophiles around the world. Marxist critics would therefore point out that fetishization of a country that is famed for having the longest living head of state in Queen Elizabeth II is essentially propaganda for the tiered and unfairly distributed power model that Marxist doctrine seeks to draw attention to. The clearly regimented understanding of who is in charge and the apparently dire ramifications should this system falter runs perfectly parallel to the rigid social forces at work, according to Marx. Although Bond is wont to bend the rules and lapse into maverick behaviour, he continues to return to base with cap in hand to issue a disingenuous but subordinate apology to his upper middle class superior. In the age of internet academics, it can be very hard to find a new angle or interpretation for those classic texts that are gathering dust in your school library. Similarly, Teachers are often at pains to point out the fact that series such as The Hunger Games or Harry Potter or Twilight do not represent what is known as literary merit 
and therefore are not worth analysing. But with literary theory, students are able to come up with new interpretations of classic texts or find ways of analysing texts that are purportedly only designed for our entertainment. If you'd like to learn more about any of the theories that I've mentioned today, then be sure to check out my recommended reading in the information section below. If you haven't already and you're in need of more literary analysis like this, then be sure to subscribe to the channel via the button below. And if you found the video in any way useful, then be sure to give it a like too. That's all for this time. Thank you for watching and goodbye.